Good morning, this is Pastor Dan, and I welcome our online congregation. When we started this ministry, it was specifically for COVID. But we've also come to realize that online worship is important for other reasons as well. Uh, it's great for anyone who is homebound or for those who are traveling or also for those who do not live in Holland but would like to worship with us. But those who do live in Holland, this is also good because it can be an introduction to learn more about Park Church. It can be a first step toward being a part of our church community. Well, this month we are thinking about community at Park. Building community is part of our vision statement. And we need to think about what kind of community do we want to be? Well, in April, our core value of the month is the value to be welcoming to all. And certainly that is a part of what we want our church culture to be. It is important to me personally that all those who do come to Park Church and those who worship with us will feel welcome when they are here. So no matter uh, how you have joined us today or for what reason, we are thankful to have you as a part of our worship. Let us worship God together. In Psalm 116, the psalmist asks this question, What shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? And then the answer comes and says, I will lift up the cup of salvation. I will call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. So what shall we do in response to the Lord's goodness to us? Let us gather together. Let us together call upon the name of the Lord, on the name of Jesus, who is our hope and our salvation. So it is good to come together and worship, to gather in the name of our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. 
And we do welcome each of you today, and we're thankful to see you here and glad that you can be a part of our worship. As always, we give a special hello and welcome to those who don't normally worship with us at Park. We're glad you're here. And also a special welcome to those who are worshiping with us online uh, from many different places, and we're glad to have you here with us as a part of our worship as well today. Well, just a note on our praise team today, and that is uh, our normal uh, worship team leader, Carol, has had to quarantine, and so she was not available to help us uh, today. So uh, we give thanks to the flexibility of our team as they uh, work together to, under those circumstances, to lead us in worship together this morning. As we begin our service, let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we are here uh, to call upon your name. We're here, Lord, in worship. We are here to learn. We are here, Lord, to celebrate together. And Lord, we pray that in this time and circumstances that are often frustrating and difficult in our lives, that this would be a time of peace, Lord, that this would be a time of joy, that this could be a time of encouragement. Lord, especially as we uh, look ahead again, and there are worries and there are anxieties, there's always things, Lord, that are hard for us and challenging and things, Lord, we don't want to face. But, Lord, in this worship, we pray that we will find strength from you. We pray, Lord, we will find direction and guidance. We ask for your spirit to be here with us, among us, to inspire us, Lord, and to open up our hearts and minds to you. And, Lord, we do pray uh, for those who would like to be here with us today but are unable to do so, uh, perhaps due to COVID issues and quarantine, but Lord, also uh, for those who are uh, not yet able to be here in a group together with us, we pray for them. And Lord, we're thankful they can join us in other ways in worship. We pray, Lord, that they would be blessed in their worship as well. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As a call to worship, today we'll begin with Job's testimony, his declaration of truth from Job 19, verse 25. In all the midst of his struggles and trials and illness, he declares, I know that my Redeemer lives and will stand again on the earth. With that in mind, let us stand together and sing our praises to God. Oh, oh, oh. 
sure. Josh, you... Last Sunday, uh, we talked more about our April core value of the month. Uh, this month, we're really focused on being welcoming to all. And as it says on here, that we will be a church that is eager to accept and assimilate all new people. And uh, last Sunday, we talked about what kind of welcoming community what kind of welcoming community do we want to be? And talked about the dangers of favoritism and how that is such a problem in many churches and can be a problem here at Park Church as well. Well, along with uh, this core value of the month comes also another memory Bible challenge. And this month, our memory Bible challenge comes from words of Jesus from Matthew 25. And this is when uh, there is a separation between the sheep and the goats. Some are, the, uh, are those that are separated to the right and then others to the left. And when this separation is talked about and discussed in the Bible, Jesus says, to those on his right, because I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. And then concludes, he says, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. 
And that's a really interesting passage because here Jesus identifies himself with the least of these. Uh, He places himself with the marginalized, with the hungry, with the stranger, with the prisoner, and then challenges his people to realize that the way we treat these, the least of these, the marginalized, the forgotten ones, that is like how we are treating Jesus himself. So that is an introduction to our prayer of confession today. Uh, We know that we don't often uh, remember those in need, and we are often selfish with our resources, with our time. And as God's people, we need to continually challenge ourselves to look to the needs of those around us. Let's pray together. Lord God, again, this is a a humbling and challenging passage in your word. God, we admit, uh, Lord, as Christians, that we have not always lived up to this challenge very well. And Lord, we are sorry uh, for times when we have opportunities to help or to bless or to notice and to remember. And Lord, for we confess for the times that we've missed those opportunities. But Lord, we are thankful for the Savior who you are. We are thankful, Lord, that you place yourself with those who are most needy. We are thankful, Lord, that you are a God of love and a God of grace and a God, Lord, who is always with us no matter our circumstances. Lord, we are thankful uh, for the forgiveness that you offer to us. And we pray as your people that we will continue to be more generous and more kind. And Lord, that we will see the needs of those around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our words of assurance come from Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer one. What is your only comfort in life and in death? That I am not my own, but belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Please stand and join us as we sing these words of truth.
Turn with me now in a time of intercessory prayer. Lord, we do uh, praise you as our hope, as our life. Lord, uh, when it comes down to it, when it is time for us to leave this earth, all we have is you. And Lord, thank you that we can have you, that we can have that assurance and that comfort, and knowing, Lord, that you will never leave us, knowing that you are a living Savior who is in the world today. Lord, we are thankful uh, today for the beauty of this spring season, and Lord, we pray that you would help us to find in these days a sense of comfort and joy and peace and contentment. Lord, help us uh, to recognize the good things that you bring into our lives. And Lord, we are thankful uh, for friends, for loving and encouraging people that you have placed in our lives. We're thankful for those, Lord, all those who work for the good of others, those who give of themselves to bless those around them. Lord, so we are uh, on this day thankful for those who are working in our community. Uh, Lord, we remember uh, police officers, we remember health care workers, teachers, school administrators. Lord, we're thankful for all the hard work and sacrifice that they have made in this last year for us. We pray you will help them and bless them in that work. Lord, we're also thankful for the work of Community Action House and for the Holland Rescue Mission and Escape Ministries and Good Samaritan and, Lord, others who are working and who are devoted in serving the marginalized. Lord, today we remember and pray for our shut-ins. We think of, Lord, our friends at Freedom Village or Rest Haven who haven't been able, Lord, to be here for a while, and we pray for Cora Dykema and for Grace and Tune. We remember Henry and Connie Walters. 
We remember Della Borman, and Lord, we pray for Irene and for Bernice and for Francis, for our friends at Cardinal Care. We pray, Lord, in these days that they will feel a greater sense of your presence with them. Lord, we also remember to pray for uh, friends at the care closet, those, Lord, who uh, have shared their prayer items with us. And we pray for the ones who are facing health challenges and battling cancer. We pray for healing. We pray, Lord, for hope for those struggling with grief and loss. Lord, and that is also uh, including those who have lost jobs or have lost hours at their jobs at work. Lord, for all those going through big changes and transitions in their lives, we remember them, and Lord, we pray for your guidance in their life. Lord, we pray for the work and mission at Park Church as we seek to be a place that is welcoming to all, we pray, Lord, that you will help us fulfill the mission and job that you have given to us to bring transformation through the powerful and wonderful name of Jesus Christ. And it is that name that we pray. Amen. And at this time, uh, Willa Beckman will be leading our children's sermon today. Mind you, use your social distancing a little bit. If you're a member of the same family, you may sit by a family member. If you um, are not of the same family, spread out just a little bit. Come on up, guys. I know you haven't done this in a while. Slow but sure. Thanks for leading the pack, Luke. You go ahead and sit on the seats or on the steps here. I want to talk to you this morning about something that I heard for the first time oh about 30 to 40 years ago and I still remember it in fact because I remember it it prompted me to get something and what I got was a little sign and what does the sign say can you read what it says Caroline it says joy that's right. And did you notice Pastor prayed for joy this morning? He prayed that we would have joy. Now, joy is a tough thing to describe because it's an emotion. But I really think a lot of you experienced it over the last couple of weeks. How, do you remember how you felt the day you woke up and the sun was out? And mom said you could wear shorts for the first time this spring. And your teacher at recess said you didn't have to wear a coat. Remember that feeling you had? It just kind of bubbles up inside of you. And what does it make you do when you have joy, Bradley? You be happy and what, how, do you, how does that show on your face? You smile. That's right. It's an attractive emotion. When you have joy, other people want to have joy. Now, this morning, the last several weeks, and we're going to continue this morning, Pastor has been talking about the Ten Commandments. Now, where did those Ten Commandments come from? Can you say it all together? Say it loud, Luke. The Bible. Where did it come It was written down in the Bible, but who, who gave these Ten Commandments? God. God the Father. Now, when did he give these commandments? Do you remember too? Was it in the New Testament or was it in the Old Testament? Go ahead. It was the Old Testament. And it was to Moses. And the people were not living right, were they? And so God made these commandments. Now, this is the God who created the world. This is the God who knew your name before you were born. And if this God made some rules, do you think they're probably pretty good things to do? Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. And the people studied these rules, and they studied them, and there were hundreds of years, and then Jesus was born, wasn't he? 
and Jesus came into the world, and he was saying things that church leaders didn't know if they agreed with. And these church leaders had studied these Ten Commandments for a lot of years. And so they were going to try and trick Jesus. And they asked Jesus a question. And they asked him, which is the most important commandment? And you know what Jesus said right away? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. He said, if you do those two things, you will have joy. And that's what this reminds me of. J is for Jesus. O is for others. Y is for yourself. So I want you to remember this. And I keep this on my refrigerator. I made little, we're going to send you home with little papers that you can color. And I'd like you to post these someplace where you see them every day. Whether it's your bedroom, your bathroom, maybe the door that leads outside. And it will remind you that if you always have Jesus first, think of others next, and then think of yourself last, you will have joy. Now, the world right now wants to tell you that you're the important one. It's however you feel that means something. But the kingdom of God wants you to have joy. Can you say it together with me? Jesus first. Others next. Yourself last have joy. I have one of these papers for each one of you, so make sure you grab them, okay? Thank you. Go back to your seat now. Now the kids could head out to children's worship. Thank you, Willa, uh, for introducing our topic for today, which is indeed, uh, we're heading back again to the Ten Commandments. And all uh, the reading from today is going to be reading uh, some of those Ten Commandments from Exodus chapter 20. And then we'll, during the sermon, we'll also be looking at some other passages as well, including uh, that passage from Matthew 5. Now, we were looking at the Ten Commandments earlier uh, this year, back in the winter time, and we made it through the first five. But as we started that series, uh, I began by talking about why the Ten Commandments are especially important. Certainly, all of the things we read about in the Bible are important, but the Ten Commandments have been set apart for a few different reasons. Uh, one of those reasons is how the Ten Commandments were given, given on Mount Sinai, written on tablets of stone, and it says, by the very hand of God. And then those Ten Commandments were given a place of honor, the stone tablets placed in the Ark of the Covenant indicating their importance. But not only how they were given, how also they are repeated, uh, written in Exodus 20, then given again in Deuteronomy 5, and then all of those Ten Commandments uh, come up in other places in the Bible. All ten are cited in the New Testament, and uh, because of that, the church has had a long tradition in its worship and its liturgy of reciting and reading the Ten Commandments, of making these words important words. Well, another thing about the Ten Commandments in the Bible is when they're listed in different places and cited in different areas, including the Sermon on the Mount, they're often uh, built on, expanded upon, 
the basic principle is listed, but then it also includes our, our attitudes, our thoughts as well. And in fact, my seminary professor, uh, I said back in January, he would say to us, properly understood, these Ten Commandments can cover all areas of ethics. So that's something uh, to remember now as we look at the Sixth Commandment, where we're picking up from our series. Uh, this is a commandment that is quite simple, just a few words, however, there are places in the Bible that talk more about it and expand upon the sixth commandment. So here, the word of the Lord now as uh, we review uh, the Ten Commandments and where we have been. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And that reminds us of the greatest commandment Willa mentioned about loving the Lord our God with all of our heart. Second, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. When we looked at the second commandment this winter, we talked about proper worship and also about representing God correctly. Uh, third, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. And we saw that is a commandment also about how we represent God to others, uh, what we say about God and describe God. Fourth, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And on that fourth commandment, uh, we talked about rest. We talked about using our time, uh, trusting in God to be at work, even when we are not at work. Fifth, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land your Lord your God is giving you. And we looked at the fifth commandment. We were reminded it's not just about our fathers and mothers, but it's about honoring all of those who God puts in authority in our lives. And then commandment six, where we focus today, you shall not murder. Well, as we conclude uh, that reading and get to the sixth commandment, we can uh, maybe have a sigh of relief. We can feel pretty good at our, about ourselves as we begin because, at least as far as I know, uh, there is no one here who has murdered anyone. And so, uh, yay, we, we can be pretty happy about that, uh, that we're following uh, the sixth commandment in that regard. But... Before we move along and make this a sermon about terrorists or mass shooters, we have to see that the Bible has more to say when it comes to this sixth commandment about murdering. And already uh, that begins in the very next chapter, Exodus chapter 21. After the Ten Commandments are given, if you keep going through the book of Exodus, there's a lot more laws listed from God uh, to the people of Israel. And the Ten Commandments are built on and expanded upon, upon including in Exodus 21 uh, at verse 28 and 29, there's an interesting example here of unintentional murder. So listen uh, to this law. It says, if a bull gores a man or a woman to death, the bull is to be stoned to death 
and the meat must not be eaten. But the owner of the bull will not be held responsible. If, however, the bull has had the habit of goring and the owner has been warned but has not kept it penned up and it kills a man or woman, the bull is to be stoned and its owner also is to be put to death. So an interesting uh, case here of unintentional murder. And in other words, what it's saying is if, if someone is a owner of a bull, they have to be a responsible bull owner. And if their bull is wild, if it has a habit of violence or aggressiveness, and that owner has been warned about their bull, and then their bull should go kill someone because it hasn't been penned or fenced in, then the owner of that bull is guilty. God counts that unintentional death as murder because it was from negligence. It was from laziness. And we can see already there that part of obeying the sixth commandment is to be responsible and a careful person someone who's paying attention. Uh, so for example, uh, if you are a gun owner, well then you need to be a responsible gun owner because that is one of the things, uh, even a simple or small mistake can be a matter of life or of death. Or if you are someone who drives a car, uh, you also don't wanna be a reckless driver when you're driving your car because even a small mistake when it comes to driving could also be a matter of life or death. Uh, so certainly I was thinking about that includes not drinking or driving, but then I also thought about not texting or driving. You know, something like that because We've been warned about not doing that, and people tell us not to do that. And then if we're tempted to do that, if we're distracted, if we're negligent, if we're not paying attention, even a small mistake can be a matter of life or death. And so I never thought in a sermon uh, I'd have an opportunity to preach about texting and driving, and yet when I read this story about the wild bull who would gore others, even though the owner had, be, had been warned, I thought this would be an apt current day example for us to consider. But really now we're just getting started because the Bible has more to say when it comes to the sixth commandment. Uh, another place that we can turn, moving way up towards now the back of the Bible, but an important passage 1 John 3.15, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Now, that's quite a statement as well right there. This idea that even hating a brother could be, in God's eyes, considered murder. Uh, the Heidelberg Catechism, when it talks about this commandment and expands upon it, it asks that question as well in 106, is this only about killing someone? And then the answer is no, that God teaches us he hates the root of murder, which is envy, hatred, anger, and vindictiveness. So those are four different attitudes the Bible describes as murderous kinds of attitudes stemming from hatred, but then also envy. Uh, envy is an example. That is when you are harboring hatred towards someone because you want what they have. And interestingly enough, it is that attitude, that sin of envy, which is the cause of the very first murder uh, that listed in human history, when Cain kills his brother Abel, it is because of envy. It begins with that root of murder, envy. Cain wanting the blessing that Abel had received. And 
then God warns him, don't go down that road. But when he allows his envy, his hatred to fester, it turns into the murder. So that is an attitude, a murderous attitude we need to fight against, not to hold on to those feelings of envy. And the Bible says to fight against that temptation, uh, we need to be thankful people. And we need to be content with the things that God has given to us. Second, uh, the catechism identifies anger as one of those roots of murder. And that's important to know that uh, anger can certainly be a cause, a root of murder. But not all anger is sin. Uh, there are times when we are right to be angry, when it comes to matters of injustice. We, we want to be angry about things when, when they're not fair. But the Bible says a lot to say about, well, how we direct that anger. How do we control that anger? What do we do with our anger, anger when we feel it? And a consistent a matter when it comes to our anger is that it has to be kept in control. If anger cannot be kept in control, if we have anger in our lives that's out of control, we need to find help. We need to get it managed. It becomes more and more dangerous also the longer we have it. So Jesus, when he talks about anger in Matthew 5, he says, settle matters quickly with your adversary. And then Ephesians 4, the same idea. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. So in other words, if you are angry with someone else, you need to either let it go or you need to address it quickly to not let it fester and build. Uh, a third example the catechism uses is the root of murder of vindictiveness. And basically, that is the desire to get revenge, vindictiveness. It's when somebody hurts you and, and you think to yourself, well, I'm going to get them back and I'm going to hurt them even more than what they did to hurt me. That is vindictiveness. Well, the Bible warns us about that as well, telling us not to take revenge, but allow God to handle that for us. And that is because revenge just causes more problems. It builds. It leads to destruction. But on the other hand, forgiveness in our lives is what will lead to peace. So those are some murderous attitudes uh, the Bible talks about. Hatred, envy, anger, vindictiveness. Those are things we also have to think about with the Sixth Commandment. But there's more. The Bible also talks about murderous words. And this is where we turn to Matthew 5 and the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, uh, speaking here, says, You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, You shall not murder. Anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you, anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. And again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. Anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. So Jesus has two different examples uh, of words that are murderous words. The first one, uh, Raka, is left untranslated. It's Aramaic. But it basically means calling someone a worthless person, meaning like you don't matter, you don't amount to anything. Really, it's similar to the next word, that word calling someone a fool. Uh, these are words that are meant to cut down, words that we use to attack someone. Uh, a, a phrase or a verb, rather, that I like to think about with these kinds of words is the verb belittle. Because when we're belittling someone, really we're making them feel small. 
Uh, that word is perfect. We're making them be little. We're making them feel insignificant. We're attacking them to cut them down. And so those kinds of belittling words that we use are destructive, murderous kinds of words. And Jesus says these words are a big deal. God understands power that these words have. He knows the great harm that mean and careless words can have on another person. And Jesus is very clear in this passage, telling us that such words put us in danger of the fire of hell. And I hope that catches your attention because it's meant to catch our attention. It's meant for us to see how serious these kinds of sins are. Well, in our world today, uh, one of the places that we can see a lot of examples of murderous words are words on the internet. Um, if you ever read the comments section of an article, or if you uh, see things on social media, even YouTube, Twitter, uh, it's just incredible uh, the amount of hatred, the amount of belittling words that you can come across on the internet. And it's what we call trolls. And people a lot of times feel like on the internet they can say whatever it is that they want to say because their identity is hidden and they're, or they're anonymous. And it makes them uh, more evil, more wretched, thinking that they can use their words to destroy and tear down. Well, it feels like, too, that in the political climate today, during COVID frustrations and all this, this is not getting better, but it seems to be getting even worse. Uh, there was an example recently in our own denomination. It was listed in the Banner magazine, if you were reading the Banner magazine. Uh, in our Office of Social Justice, this is an office that can be kind of controversial at times because when it comes to social justice, you're often getting into some political areas and people have strong opinions about political things and that is fine. But what is not fine is that the Office of Social Justice started receiving on their website and online murderous kinds of threats and online harassment personal attacks against the people uh, who worked at the Office of Social Justice, so much so uh, that they had to call the authorities and report these comments. They increased security at the denominational building in Grand Rapids because they didn't know uh, about these threats, if they would be carried out or not. Well, when there was an investigation made into those online comments, it turns out that those comments were coming from Christian Reformed Church members, elders, and at least one Christian Reformed pastor. So that's sad. I mean, that's embarrassing even that people who normally we would meet and probably think like, wow, that's a really great person. That's a nice person. They're kind and polite. And in real life, they'd probably be very welcoming and smiling and be glad to see you, but then you get someone online with their anger, thinking they're anonymous, thinking their words are protected, and it's like they become the spawn of Satan, you know? It's like it's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde that, that they just feel as if they can just say whatever it is they're going to say. But we know that no matter what we think is done in private, the Bible says we'll be exposed by the light. And we know that God sees the things that we post online. God knows the things that we text to other people. It's not like those things are hidden at all. And we are responsible as God's people to follow the, the as Jesus commands us on the Sermon on the Mount, is not to use belittling words in any forum that we come across. So I think just as a general rule, uh, if, if you don't want your pastor to see it, if you don't want your mom to read it, then don't send it, uh, don't post it on the internet. 
Well, another uh, big problem that's grown, especially in our young people today, is the issue of cyberbullying. Uh, I looked up some examples of what cyberbullying is. These are examples uh, from stopbullying.gov. So examples, posting comments or rumors about someone online that are mean, hurtful, or embarrassing. Threatening to hurt someone or telling them to kill themselves. Posting a mean, hurtful, or embarrassing picture online or video. Uh, Pretending to be someone else online in order to post personal information about someone else. Posting mean or hateful names, comments, or content about any race, religion, or ethnicity, or other personal characteristics online. Or creating a mean or hateful web page about someone. Well, I I wish I wouldn't even have to read or cite those kinds of examples, but I felt like it is important to understand what cyberbullying is because this is a problem, and it is a problem among Christians and Christian young people, perhaps feeling like they can be bolder online. We can tend to be meaner as well. Well, we want to think about this kind of behavior because Jesus tells us clearly in the Bible that such behavior is linked with murder. The truth is many of us are going uh, to post things or send things online that are going to hurt or belittle someone else, and that is the kind of behavior we must stop. Well, if you are a victim also of cyberbullying, then we also need to know and understand that this should not remain in the dark, but that it should be exposed to the light, and we should report it and tell especially a trusted adult of what you are getting bullied or how you are getting bullied online. Another thought I had on that is also not to be a silent bystander. Uh, If you see someone else doing this or are aware of something else going around about someone else, not to be silent, but to step in and to be brave and to say, no, this is wrong. This is not something we can do. But as we think about those mean ways we use our words, I also today wanted us to think about ways that our words can also be used in a positive way. How our words can, yes, be used to tear down, but the Bible says our words can also be used to build up. So in Ephesians 4, 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. So thinking about that, I wanted us to think today not just about negative things that we've heard or that someone else has told us, but to think about what is a time in your life when someone said something positive, something encouraging to you, something that built you up, something that always you can remember and perhaps made a real difference in your life. So I was thinking about uh, those kinds of positive, encouraging messages that that I have received from others in my life. And and thankfully, there are many examples I could think of and point to, but a couple specifically that I remembered. One, when I was a freshman at college, and at the time I was in the education program, uh, my ambition was to be a high school English teacher. Some of you know that. And, but for that year, I was also in a process of discernment. I didn't know if education was the right path for me. And as I was praying about that and discerning about that, and I was even thinking, well, perhaps seminary, is, is that what God has for me in my future? Uh, I had an opportunity then to lead devotions in our dorm. And so I was thinking about that, and I was 
thinking, you know, maybe this is a time where, where God can give me some direction. Maybe this is a time when, when God can make it more clear what he wants for me in my future. And so, uh, so I led devotions that night in the dorm, and afterwards, uh, a sophomore girl named Anita, someone who I hardly knew, but this sophomore came up to me and said, like, well, thank you, Dan. Uh, I think you should do more of this kind of thing. And she said, in fact, have you ever thought of being a pastor? And that, to me, was such an answer to prayer. It was one of those times in life where a positive, encouraging comment really made a difference, and it helped me decide uh, where I should be heading. Uh, another example I, I thought of, uh, again, when I was younger, this now back in high school, and at the time, as even is true still today, but I really liked to sing, and I liked to sing worship songs. But especially uh, in high school, I did not have a good singing voice, and, and I knew that I wasn't a good singer, and I was uh, kind of self-conscious about that. And so when it came to singing, I usually did not sing out. I usually sang very quietly and, and uh, reserved. But there was a time uh, when I was on a youth retreat, and we were singing a song that I loved, and I, I was just belting it out, and I put my hands up. And one of those times, I just felt like, I don't care if I'm singing this badly. I'm just going to sing. And then later on, the youth pastor uh, uh, saw, uh, pulled me aside and said to me, you know, Dan, I was really inspired by your worship. I saw in you the joy of Jesus. And, and those words have always meant something to me because even to this day, I, I, I'm someone I want to sing out. I, I, and I know I'm not a great singer, but I just want to be someone who can worship without worrying about what other people around me might think, but to just worship God. So those were a couple of times in, in my life where some positive, encouraging words were spoken, words to build me up. And I hope that there are things in your life that you can also recall. But then I also want us to say, let us be those kinds of people. Uh, let us be the kinds of people who say things to others that are going to make a difference to them for the positive. Uh, let's look for ways we can encourage and build up and use our words in positive ways because we don't know at times when something we say may help to change someone's life for the good. When it comes to words that have power and grace and love, we find a lot of those words in the Bible. And thinking today on the sixth commandment, you know, I hope this is a sermon that challenges us, that helps us think about, well, although maybe I've never uh, murdered someone, but in what ways with my attitudes, with my hatred, my anger, my envy, with my words, how have I done those murderous kinds of things in my life? And, and I hope that does humble us and challenge us, but there's something good that comes out of being humbled and challenged. And that is because when we see more clearly our sin, we also see more clearly our need for a Savior. And when we humble ourselves, when we bring these things to God in confession, then some of the most powerful words that have ever been spoken come true. And those are words from 1 John chapter 1, which say, when we confess our sins. He is faithful and just, and he will forgive all of our sins and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's have a moment of prayer together. Lord God, uh, help us today to uh, see the ways that we allow our attitudes of anger and envy and vindictiveness and hatred, Lord, how those things can uh, cause hurt and harm to others. Help us, Lord, to see how our 
belittling words, uh, what harm those words can have. Lord, help us to understand uh, the great harm that such things can have even online or Lord, even maybe at times we don't think it's a big deal, but it might be a very big deal to someone else. So Lord, instead, help us, uh, challenge us to follow the directions from Ephesians 4, where we are told not to let the unwholesome talk come out of our mouths, but rather what is useful for building others up. And God, help us to be your people who build others up. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, today, instead of a song of response, uh, we have words of response. And uh, the praise team will lead us in a responsive reading that's on our screen. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred... Let me sow love. Where there is doubt, where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. Joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood, as to understand, to be loved, as to love. For it It is in giving that that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Also, a few announcements to call your attention to this morning. Our weekly offering uh, today is for Humanity for Prisoners, uh, an appropriate cause in light of the passage from Matthew 25 we considered earlier. Uh, Sunday School uh, is meeting today in Catechism for grades 3 through 8th grade. And then um, in the bulletin, there are also some volunteer requests to note. Uh, Some mowers are being uh, looked for, recruited, some weeders, uh, some people for the meals to go. There are a few different uh, ways to get involved, so note those requests. Uh, Next Sunday, now, next Sunday, we continue going through the Ten Commandments and If you know what comes after commandment six, commandment seven is the commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Uh, I just wanted to note that for parents, uh, this is something that I know will have uh, third graders and up in worship, and I will remember that in the sermon, but also for parents to understand that that is coming next Sunday. Uh, Next Sunday also, there is a congregational meeting I hope that uh, many of you can be a part of that. We'll dismiss after church and about five minutes later, regather for a congregational meeting. It's been a while uh, since we've had one. And uh, in addition to talking about our nominations and that process, uh, there is other information and news from the council we'd like to share and talk about. Uh, We will live stream that as well uh, for those who are a part Uh, who are not yet coming in to in-person worship. Uh, There's also absentee ballots out available today uh, if you know that you're not going to be here next Sunday. And then another uh, bit of council news that I can announce today, and it's a good day to do it. Uh, You may have note that maybe some of our middle schoolers are looking especially tired, uh, but that is because on Friday night, they had a lock-in here at the church and stayed up late, late into the night and had a fun time together. Um, And the reason why it was uh, Hannah and Jordan and Jake, our youth leaders, said, you know, we want to do this lock-in because our middle schoolers have had a lot of disappointments and a lot of things have been canceled and they couldn't do their winter retreat and we're not going to have serve. And these other things, and so they did it just as something special 
for our middle schoolers, our youth. And I just thought, you know, that is such a, a wonderful thing. And our youth leaders, and Hannah and Jake and Jordan, have just done uh, some great work this year, and I really appreciate them as a pastor, also as a parent. And well, also, so the good news, it's also fun to report good news, is that uh, the council uh, talked with Hannah about expanding on her job description and, and maybe taking on some more with children's. And also, uh, she's someone who has helped us get our, our online worship uh, more current and up to speed. And so we said, Hannah, there's, there's more work for you to do here. And she said, yes. And so uh, we're thankful that in the next year ahead, her position will be expanded as ch uh, director of youth and children and online ministry. So uh, we welcome her and we're glad she can be a part of it. Uh, now let's stand for a benediction. As we go out from this place, we go out to love and to serve our Lord. We go out to bring his words of love, grace, and truth to a world that desperately needs them. So go out with his blessing and may the love of God the Father, the grace of his son Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Together we say, amen. amen.